Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three great resources for Dungeon Masters. The first is Letters from the Dark Volume 7, Monster Mash. And it's the, the only one that's primarily Shadow Dark focused. Um, and so it's going to be less useful, I think, for other games. But it certainly has a lot of great ideas, a lot of great tables, and some new adventures. Six full adventures in here that you could easily adapt to other OSR games. So I'm going to cover this uh, in some detail. It's 94 pages. It's a great addition to the Letters from the Dark series. Uh, the second one I'm going to cover is The Dungeon Dozen 2, More Random Tables for Fantasy RPGs by Jason Schultes. I have reviewed the first one before. I flipped through it, and it's great. This one is no different. In fact, I think I like this one even better. The tables are a lot more... Well, they're, they're, in my opinion, more fun. I like them. So we'll go through. This is 266 pages. So there's no way we're going to get through the whole thing, but I'll go through a lot of it and just to give you guys a sense of what it's like. And then finally, I want to cover The Old School Referee by Highlander. This is a, it's a 19-page document, and it's essentially, it's a little bit like uh, that document that was put together a few years ago by Questing Beast and a couple other DMs, I think, or, or people out there. Um, at least maybe one other person. And it was called, like, Old School or OSR gaming, or o o running an OSR game, or something like that. It's a little bit like that in its intention. But the writing is really clear. Um, if you know Highlander, um, Highlander put out Shadow and Fae, which I've reviewed. I love Shadow and Fae, I thought it was a great book, with a lot of great tables, and a really interesting mechanic, and uh, the system was fun. And the Old School Referee is mostly advice on how to run old school games. There's some tables in the back, but I think it's a must read. It's free, you can just check it out, and go download it. Um, but I think it's a must read for anybody who's reading the OSR, not because it's all something that I agree with or because I think it's all right, but because it is a really good perspective and I think most of it is, is stuff that we could all s stand to read again, right? So there's some things that I won't do, some things that I don't do, some things that I do differently than what is said here. But the whole thing, I was like, this is awesome. This is great to have advice for someone who's like, I don't know what the OSR is. And here's a great resource. You read through this and you have a, a better sense of what it's like to run an old school game as opposed to 5th edition, right? Because that's where most most people who are experiencing D&D &D or RPGs for the first time are coming to D&D 5th edition. And then they're finding the OSR in the course of that, you know, investigation. <laughs> so I think for those sorts of DMs, this is a great resource. So for people like me. All right. Well, let's go back through Letters from the Dark, Volume 7, Monster Mash. This is a great book. So essentially, this book has a whole bunch of extra ancestries for Shadow Dark, and each of those ancestries are um, monstrous. So they're you know, things like lizard folk, um, which you're not really given any, any monstrous ancestries in the base book. Um, here's what you get. You get the whole cover of the book, and it's all hyperlinked, which is great. The art is awesome. As if you've seen the other Letters from the Dark, you'll know that all of the, con the art is always great. And the writing is, is fantastic. The introduction is written in persona, someone in the world, you know, the, so it's sort of a, you know, in-world writing. And then you get really cool, uh, yeah, a great piece of art there, that orc punching that guy in his face, breaking his visor. That's a good one. Resources. So expanded resources for players and GMs. What does monstrous mean? The different ancestries. You roll a D100 table if you want to adjust the, uh, you know, the how likely is a random NPC to be of a particular ancestry. You can roll on the table. Very unlikely to be any of the monstrous ones, but you can change those if you want it, obviously. How do non-player characters react to monstrous adventurers? There's some stuff about coding and cultures and alignment. You know, you can, you can keep that in your game, obviously, and I think it's often very good advice. Um, alignment, all chaotic, right? <laughs> 10 chaotic. Or diverse, so you know you can choose how to uh, how to make your monsters and how they how they react. Chaotic is an interesting alignment in fifth edition you know, alignment period, right? I mean, there's just huge huge arguments to be made in favor of alignment and against alignment as a system. Um, I think it's a great uh, like it's a great touchstone or like a you know, thing to, to reference, but if you're, if you're enslaved to alignment, right? If, you're just, if, that's, if, that, if that's what you make as your main thing is alignment, then you're gonna be really simplistic, I think, in your world building. So I tend to use alignment very, very, in a limited way. Um, ancestry variants. So if you want characters to have a more particular kind of ability based on their back or their ancestry, then you can give them these backgrounds, uh, these, other, these other variants. Um, they don't seem overpowered. The human one seems overpowered. Um, 
maybe not. <laughs> it does mean your human character is going to be higher level than the rest of your party, because I think everybody gets XP at the same rate in Shattered Ark, and the normal level of requirement is just the same for everybody. So this is an interesting one. It's trying to capture that old school idea of humans having a higher cap of levels. They can usually get up faster than the other, you know, race as class um, people. I don't think I would ever use that, but it certainly <laughs> it would be tempting. It would be tempting for players if you gave them the option. Um, so, I like the half orc die hard. Whenever you drop to zero hit points, gain a luck token. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I think there are some really good abilities here, um, and they're fun. They're they're interesting variants. I think you could have a lot of fun switching them out um, into your game. Use how to modify NPC stat blocks from the base book, which is a great idea, right? Special NPC modifications. So you take an NPC from the base book or from the other Letters from the Dark, Volume Six, where they had all those NPCs. Um, the, the whole you know rogues gallery of NPCs you could use. You just switch out these stats um, or add in these modifications and now you have not just a peasant but a doppelganger peasant, right? You don't just have a reaver but a giant reaver. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Um, languages and what I really like about this is ways of thinking about the writing uh, or, you know, uh, for each of the, the the alphabets for each of these languages and how they might sound, I think that's really cool. We often just say, oh, and the guy speaks to you in giant, but it's interesting to think of, like, what it might sound like uh, and, and then to describe that to the players. Um, you get a whole bunch of really cool pieces of advice there. And that's what I mean by this is, you know, it's for Shadow Dark, but you could use this for any game. There's a lot of good advice here. And stuff like the Ancestries are going to be more specific. You have Beastmen um, and their characteristics. They have wild heart. When you roll wild encounter checks, roll your uh, reaction check with advantage. So they're they're good at interacting with uh, animals. That's not an overpowered ability. I think that's awesome, right? And you're going to see stuff like that where the abilities that are given are not overpowered relative to Shadow Dark. But the power creep is always the fear whenever you're releasing supplements for any system, right? As a DM, GM, you know the base game, you know it's balanced, you know how to run it, you you you, you know how to balance it for your table and for your needs. And then you add in a supplement and things can really get off kilter if you're not careful. And I think this does a good job, uh, Chris does a great job of keeping things within the realm of Shadow Dark power. Um, the Null, while conscious you can use your action to eat a ration and regain one hit point, so rations are a free hit point. That's pretty good, but not overpowered. <laughs> you get to Null NPCs, and I like that for each of them you get an NPC section as well. Um, the Hurler is you can carry three thrown weapons per gear slot. That's pretty cool. I like that for the Bugbear. For the Hobgoblin, once per day, turn an ally successful attack roll into a critical hit. That's really good. Really good. Um, you use that with an ally like Thief, and that is suddenly you're doing a crit on sneak attack, doing massive damage. I mean, you could really, really... Uh, I think that one's the closest to being overpowered, but it's only once per day. But still... In one of my games, I, I essentially gave a character a once-per-day auto-kill. It wasn't intentional. It was in 5th edition, and, and things stacked up to the point where it was that. And he used it so effectively, we had to say, okay, we can't, we can't use that. Anymore. We have to take it away. Because, yes, once-per-day once, once per day auto kill, which is what that sounds like for if you combine it with a sneak attack, is, uh, like, it can be really dang good. Um, and then you get... Uh, yeah, NPCs for each of them, which I really like. Lizard Folk, Shed Skin, once per week, you can instantly remove all physical status effects and strength dex con damage. That's pretty good, too. It's kind of cool, you shed your skin. <laughs> it's a really flavorful uh, ability. Orcs, Battle Cry, once per day, give your enemies disadvantage on their morale check. That's really cool. So it's a variation. Uh, of course, you know, half orcs are what you have in the base book. This is an interesting variation on playing the big, tough orc, you know. Um, and you have that Battle Cry, which makes your enemies flee faster. That's cool. Um, again, I think that could be really powerful if you used it in the right situation. The Viparian, once per day, you can force an enemy to roll the minimum possible damage on a damage roll. That's really good. Uh, once per day, but you can just say, you roll minimum damage. <laughs> Big fireball goes off and it does four damage. Yeah. Very good there. Does it happen melee? No, it's a damage roll, yeah. So any, any, any damage. You have some Viparian deities, uh, and then character names for each of the ancestries, group names for their tribes and packs and things like that. Great piece of art there, fighting on top of an altar. Um, the Viparians are attacking. Classic piece of pulp old school art there. And then you have six adventures, and they're all really cool. Each of them focuses on a different monster, basically. 
and they're all really cool. So you can see below the adventure, the level of the adventure, the theme, and then the type of adventure it is. And you have a brief description of each of them here. So you've got Blood and Steel, which is a five plus level adventure for orcs, or the theme is orcs. And it's a dungeon crawl. And there's Final Delivery, which is three plus, Lizard Folk, Hex Crawl. Goblin Games, level zero, Goblinoids, and it's a gauntlet. Now, the interesting thing about Goblin Games is you can actually get that for free on DriveThruRPG. I'll put a link below to where you can get this and that. Um, it's a free document, or maybe pay what you want. Uh, a free Goblinoid-themed gauntlet, which is really funny. Uh, so yeah, we'll check that out. Hyena Boy, 1 plus for gnolls, and that's the urban mystery. The Snake Pit, which is a level 1 adventure, Viparians, uh, and it's a, tight, it's a jailbreak. And then there's Stolen Sun, which is a level 1 adventure for beast men, and it's a race against time. That one's really pulpy, old school. It feels like, you know, um, oh gosh, Rankin and Bass. It feels like, you know, Fire and Ice or something like that. It's a really cool adventure. I like them, I like them all, actually. I think they're great. You have the NPC stat blocks that, are, that appear in this particular event, uh, these sets of adventures. And then you have the, the different adventures. Blood and Steel. Um, and create characters, read the hook aloud, and distribute knowledge, prior knowledge, uh, and allow the party to formulate their plans. So you give, um, you give the players particular set set up so for this one it says uh ancestry any especially orcs and half orcs so you can do that in level five is level recommended and you go through the dungeon it's a great dungeon crawl cool map there You've got lots of loops lots of links you can see that there you know the water goes from eight all the way down through 11 10 to down through 10 it looks like all the way down uh into 18 so maybe you could use that um several entrances into this place lots of lots of different places to interact with and link it's a good, it seems like a really good map and uh, some, some good stuff going on in here. Slave camps, <laughs> spiders, to liberate the blood steel orcs. A Durgar, you're fighting some Durgar. So orcs versus Durgar, basically, which is pretty cool. And there's multiple quests you can encounter as you run in. There's some drow down here. Final delivery. So this one has any lizard folk PCs could be diplomats from other tribes. Null PCs could be guides hired to help cross the savannah. All answers are welcome to the city of Freeport, level three. And uh, the setting requirements is that a city with a nearby savanna and jungle. So that's really cool. Basically it tells you, okay, how are you gonna fit this into your world? You could run it as a one shot, you could fit it into an, a bigger game. Um, here's the hex with a bunch of locations that you can encounter and you go through. Freeport is a huge city on the edge of the jungle, 50,000 people of all ancestries. Uh, I should say it should be the biggest city in the region. That's a pretty big in, in fantasy medieval terms, 50,000 people. Um, there's an ancient ziggurat, which is awesome. A treetop village with some talking apes. The RNPF Camp, the Royal Natural Philosophers Foundation. <laughs> That's so good. I love that sort of thing. Really funny. The Namakatsi, the Teshek, the Teshek village with the NPCs that are present there. A great adventure. You the Goblin Games, and again, this one is really cool. You have each player rolls four level zero characters. All four characters controlled by one player are siblings as they share an ancestry. Each player rolls a d6. Goblins, bugbears, or hobgoblins. Well, it's your, it's your birthday. Well, not exactly, but you're one-ish year old, so it's about time you proved yourself. No bugbear, goblin, or hobgoblin in Muck Tongue Tribe is worth spitting on until they've completed the fabled goblin games. If you make it through the obstacle course and bring back a load of fun loot, you'll be celebrated and fully initiated into Muck Tongue society. If you don't, well, we weren't that attached to you anyway. Now, what's interesting is it says a variant, instead of a gauntlet, you can run a funnel. Right? Gauntlets, you control one character at a time, and each time they die, the next one comes in. The funnel, you control everybody at once. That's really interesting. And you can play this as a funnel, which is you control all four characters at once, or each player controls all four characters. That would be crazy. That's usually how I run these, by the way. I usually run gauntlets as funnels. I usually run them where the players control every character at once. Um, I think it's more fun. <laughs> Plus, the player then can choose who, who encounters each, each particular trial and it has a little bit more flexibility in how they approach these challenges. Obstacle courses. There's lots of funny tricks and traps and things here. Ouchie holes. Hyena boy, any ancestry level one, and setting as a villager town on the edge of a swamp. So that's a pretty easy one to, to connect. Marty Marvelous presents, the, the Morty Marvelous presents Hyena boy. Man, animal, fairy, alien, demon. I'm stumped, Dr. Vaughn Ravenway. The new star attraction of Morty's magnificent monster menagerie. See it for yourself under the big top just outside the village of Elmswell. Great. It's a circus. Bad stuff's going on. Uh, yeah. And the snake pit. One thing is interesting is that it kind of ends. Each adventure ends, and then the next one just just begins. Yeah, it's not a big problem. There's no like piece of art separating them out, but that's okay. <laughs> it's really just a, it's not nothing. 
Characters. Characters start with no equipment. They'll have to procure it from the dungeon. Level 1 characters. Any. Viparian PCs are prisoners from rival Viparian houses, so we can be anybody here and use it. A dungeon you're trying to escape from. You're trying to get out of the prison, the uh, ziggurat, where you've been trapped. Uh, and then Stolen Sun, which is the Beastmen, all level 1 characters, limited, uh, they only speak Thanian, they don't even speak common, so you can't let your PCs speak any language but Beastman, because they're NPCs that are bad in here, they're a rival adventuring party. So essentially, what I like about this one is you guys are playing the monsters, <laughs> from the perspective of the adventurers who you run across. You're playing the monsters, and it's they're the ones who are stealing from the temple, and you're trying to stop them. So it's kind of like the reverse of a regular D&D adventure, which is kind of interesting. I like that. It's a very simple adventure, it's more of a point crawl, and then you get to the end where there is a, um, a, a very small dungeon. And then you get the end. With the next issue, which is Letters from the Dark, Volume 8, Lucky Stars. Alien spacecraft. Aliens, robots, bizarre creatures, and more. I actually can't wait for that one. I like, I like science fantasy, I like science fiction in my fantasy. Um, a little bit of it, not necessarily all, but I like a little bit of it. And I think that, I'm looking forward to that one. I mean, Chris has done really well with all of his other books so far. I think that will be an excellent one as well. All right, the next one is The Dungeon Dozen 2, as I wanted to cover. More Random Tables for Fantasy RPGs by Jason Schultes. Um, I'm just going to jump right into this one. If you guys have seen The Dungeon Dozen 1, you'll know it's just a bunch of random tables about a bunch of random stuff. And that's what this is too. And when I say random, I mean really random. Here's the table of contents. Aloof in the underworld, also hanging around the vampire lord's underworld estate. Uh... Cultural Peculiarities of the Isolated City-State, uh, Dungeon Geniuses, Eldritch Sidekicks, uh, Flora in the Garden of Death, The Gods Must Be Jerks, in the, garden, in the Dungeon Larder, In the Saloon, It Fell from the Heavens, It's in the Wizard's Pipe, and of course the whole thing is hyperlinked, which is great. Mementos on display in the Dungeon Overlord's Sanctum, Only Dragons Get Critical Hits. Random items, dungeon level 1, random items, dungeon level 2, all the way down to legend, dungeon level 10. So now you're famous. Street wildlife in the big city. Weird dungeon fog. We search the lich's body. We search the heap of detritus. We search the dead ogre king's body. We search the dead god's body. We search the dead emperor's body. Uh, yeah, but these zombies. Yeah, but this sea serpent. Subtitle. This psychic sea serpent's inscrutable demands. Yes, but why is this dungeon unstable? Yes, even more potions and Zealots of the Underworld. Then you get an index at the back. So I'll just go through a few of these to show you guys what they're like. Aloof in the Underworld. Underworld entities that couldn't care less about you or your interests. Now this is hyperlinked and I want to click on it. Oh, it just brings you back out a little bit. It just makes you zoom out a little bit. Uh, Boulderman. Giant rocks cursed with startling intelligence. Telepathic, sessile, ambitious, long-term planners, but must wait for forces of nature slash incredibly strong creatures to tra affect travel. If smashed, become intelligent heaps of stones. Four is pure intellect embodied in colossal fungal bloom, filling vast chamber. Essentially death-proof, pulsates a good deal, automatically seizes the minds of any sentient beings within 150 feet, but readily discards as boring or pointless. Powerful telepathic broadcast just makes very rude comments in a very loud psychic voice. <laughs> Dejected deity, giant-sized human with head cradled in hands, blazing halo, gleaming platinum loop broken and cast aside. From time to time shakes, tremendous fist at cold, uncaring cosmos, but otherwise unwilling to share feelings, acid tears, and danger any nearby. Diseased demon lord, racked by chills, exploding boils, steams, foul, oily sweat. Projectile vomits poison at random intervals, but still unbelievably powerful. Must eat of divine flesh for cure. Unless you've got some, you may wish to get the hell out of the way. Also hanging around the vampire lord's underworld estate. Incomprehensible trans-dimensional entity in charge of long-distance mind control observation. Violates civil liberties on those of those on the BL's enemies list. The genius bacteria in a filthy glass jar selves as eldest living things advise and enlighten via telepathy. Throngs of sub, sub vampire sycophants suck up VL's largesse, uh, reassuming their host's uh, surprisingly delicate ego. Reassuring their host's surprisingly delicate ego is needed. Amuse selves in downtime with appalling amateur Grand Gouzenal Theater Productions and dedicated performance. Work. These are great. Also removed by the remove curse spell. If saving throw is failed, roll 1d4 minus 1 to determine the side effects. Reroll. All knowledge of financial affairs, past and present, including current contents of purse. Sense of humor, leaving a rigid, literal interpretation of everything in its wake. Personal charm, the will to wear pants. All right, this is great. So the remove curse spell, if it goes wrong, can actually remove something else about you. Ambush on the road in humanoid country. What ambushes you? Army of evil, light infantry, heavy infantry, cavalry and air support, special forces. So you roll up four of those and you have a 
particular evil army, especially the assassins for hire, and then automatic evil army field marshal generator, um, who is the draft animal. So what are their draft animals? What are the conveyance? Who is the rider? Atop the tallest peak, the barbarians call it style. Tall black leather helmets festooned with multitude of small dried pterodactyl things. Bumpkins of evil, the bachelor farmer, the traveling salesman, the swamp dwelling weirdo. <laughs> these are so great, man. That's what uh, one of the quotes at the beginning of the book says. You don't roll on these tables. You read them and dream better dreams. And I think that's totally true. You, you don't necessarily want to use these tables. At least I don't use these tables as like, oh, I'm going to use this exactly for what I need. Because it's hard to find it when I want it. Like if I'm looking at building a dungeon, I'm not necessarily going to remember that there's a particular table that I really wanted in there and that one of the 12 entries will be really what I want to work. But what these books do, what the dungeon does and one and two both do, is it helps get me out of ruts and it helps me be way more creative. I tend to be very samey in my creation, I have to admit. I have a particular playbook of dungeon and style and things that I prefer and tropes and vibe and tone and all this stuff. And books like this help me inject weird into my games and overturn the same old thing that I've been running again and again. I've, many of my worlds feel the same if I just if I just leave, if I just do all the world building. <laughs> my worlds end up feeling very, very similar. And so books like this really help me get out of that rut. So I highly recommend you guys check this out. As you can see, there's just table after table after table, 266 pages of tables of amazing art, funny entries, creative, flavorful things that will get you in the mood, in the mindset of running weirder games, which, you know, not everyone always wants weirder games. Don't get me wrong. So, you know, you might not use this book all the time. You might not use the tables from it. But I highly recommend that you guys check out The Dungeon Dozen 2. Really cool. All right. The third that I want to uh, go cover is The Old School Referee by Highlander. And again, you guys can get this one, pay what you want, or free, I think, on Drive RPG. It's just a great bit of writing and help in how to approach OSR gaming. Now, again, many of you, most of you, have been running... D&D OSR games for forever. You don't need someone telling you how to do it. Maybe you need refreshers on this or that concept. You need to be reminded of cool elements that you've forgotten over time as you play. That's often for me. I've been running for a long time now. I forget things. I, I, I forget the cool elements you can do over here or over there. Um, it's nice to go back over fundamentals sometimes. So for that, it's a great refresher book. I think that's awesome. But for other people who are really brand new to this stuff, who don't really know how to engage, I think this is a great, great book. First of all, the art is great. It's all public domain. And uh, I like that um, J. Christopher Earle, um, Highlander, puts together all of the uh, uh, art and the attributions from these public domain sources. I love some of these artists a lot. Um, I'm actually, all the art is great, but some of the artists in particular, Gustave Dore is one of, my, one of my favorites. I think it's Dore. People say Dore, but I think it's Dore. Or Dore. Uh, you have a table of contents here. It's not hyperlinked, but it's only a 19 page document in spread, 30 pages in in the two-page form. Um, and you can see what it is. It's refereeing essentials, how to grow a world, adventure crafting, how to play a day of the, at, on the day of the game, mo advice for monsters, advice for treasure, and then an appendices with tables for adventures, last minute, and, and, and tables for, for prep. So, uh, information. How to lay out what the, what the PCs know, what they see. What if they don't know? What if you don't know? Adjudication, neutrality, boundaries. And there's just some great, great pieces of advice. Now, this is the sort of pamphlet. I think a lot of a lot of systems, when people try to write an RPG system, they try to put something like this at some point in their book, right? Either at the beginning or the end, and it's usually very, very terse. It's usually very brief, maybe a page or two, and it just covers stuff that, like most people, probably already know, and it doesn't do it in a very fully fleshed out way. Sometimes it's done better than others, you know, certainly. But most of the time I'm like, I would rather just have more tables in your book or more rules about how to run your particular game or something like that. These are the sorts of documents, right, which are set aside specifically for these sort of big, broader points, like how to adjudicate, how, how to be neutral, how to, how to set those boundaries. Um, that's the sort of thing that a separate document is good for. And I think books like this, this is, this is, perfect. This is exactly right. Like if you're going to put that sort of advice together, put it in a book like this and offer it with a bit more thought behind it, a bit more detail, make it the focus of the whole book. That way people, because again, like 
most people's tiny RPGs, right? <laughs> when I say tiny, I don't mean that they're insignificant or, or haven't or aren't amazing or haven't they haven't put a ton of work in them. What I mean is the reach that they're going to have relative to games like Fifth Edition. Um, people feel the need. I, I see over and over our DMs, GMs feel the need to put how to play RPGs generally into those books. And my my recurrent thought is, look, if someone's if someone's playing your game, chances are they have played other RPGs before because you know, yours is very small in terms of its reach. So I don't think you need to put generic advice in your books about how to run RPGs, what an RPG is, how to role play. If you're gonna do advice, you should put advice for what makes your system different and how to run your system to its to its max, like how to take advantage of what your system does differently. That's what I think is good advice. You see that in a few books, you see that in a few books. Um, I think you see that, for example, in um, Crown and Skull by Runehammer Games. You see that's a really good element of that book's advice. There are some points about how to run generally from Hank Renfernail's um, philosophy of game design and, and, and playing RPGs. But there's also like, here's how to make use of this system. So yeah, that rant over. <laughs> this sort of generic, general advice is really good in a book that is designed to appeal for general advice. That's what it's for. All right, that, that's what that's what uh, this is what people should look for if they're looking for that kind of general advice. At the end of the day, if people stop putting how to role play in their small RPGs and instead put in how to play this game better, uh, I would be just so much so much happier. <laughs> All right, um, growing a world, how to how to build a world from tiny seeds, sprouts, troubles, treasures, and faces. Three great little um, tabs. I love that. Uh, three examples, a dragon, a corrupt temple, and a falling star. A three-dimensional world, how to build that. Scale, planting seeds and again paths, I think that's really cool. Dimension, time, calendars, impending events on downtime and the passing of ages. How to craft adventures, a shared goal, a challenging goal, a rewarding goal, a complete goal. That is so cool. Look at the specifics of our adventures. You need a shared goal, you need a challenging goal, and a rewarding goal. Man. Uh, so many times I see adventures where one or more of those are missing. Uh, very often when I'm creating an adventure, it's one of the hardest things I would say for me is to create a shared goal. It's very hard for me to get the players on the same page, especially if I play with players who have a wide range of, of interests in the game, and I often I often have my own things that interest me. I mean, we all do. And so I tend to create adventures that interest me, and that sometimes interests everybody, but most of the time it really interests a couple people, and a couple people you know, go along for the ride because they want to play D&D. Um, so, just good advice about this. Trial, scenery, stakes, and an example. How to connect scenes, like hallways, um, in a dungeon or outside the dungeon. Right? <laughs> uh, clues, building pressure, rumors and hooks, smoothing it out, and then the day of the game, what do you do? Before the players arrive, arrive. Um, and then prepare world notes. Now again, not a, and all of this advice is stuff that I necessarily agree with. Um, so. Uh, Keep that in mind. But as a new as a new GM, as a new uh, referee, this is a really valuable resource. Um, when they arrive, how to how to move forward, how to play the game as it goes forward, forging characters, and party ties, and how to run the game, describing, clarifying, adjudicating, ending on time after the game. You get some advice for is this Shadow and Fey. It, it pertains to Shadow and Fey specifically. Um, so keep that in mind this is a, a supplement for that book, but it also it could apply to other games if you adapt. Special abilities for monsters, again, advice on how to do that. Treasure, again, it applies to Shadow and Fae, but you could use it for other games, different tables of, of treasure. Particular gems, particular arcana, tables, three tables for arcana, and then special arcana, or rather arcana by name, so if you want a particular piece of information. And again, it's built for Shadow and Fae, but you could adapt some of these ideas to your own game. Not all of them are sort of generic. Some of them are more like what you'd see in another RPG, but many of them are unique and, and more, I would say, more interesting. <laughs> like Feather Talisman, right? You may use your reaction to activate it, becoming light as a feather for a minute. Um, you think of it, oh, it's a Feather Fall Talisman, but not really, because Feather Fall is a particular spell with a particular effect. This just says you become light as a feather. And the players could find other uses for that besides just Feather Fall. Um, or the Bottomless Goblet, right? A white goblet with a small hole in the bottom of the cup. When filled with a non-magical liquid, it will stay full even if poured until completely turned upside down. Incredibly useful. It's, that's a relic. 
Uh, you could, you know, as long as you hold the cup of water in your hand and you don't let it tip over, you have water for through the desert. And that's a really cool item, stuff like that. Enchanted items, and then you have adventures that really work with this particular Shadow and Face system, or OSR generally. And I think the list is great. There's a lot of really good ones here. And then last minute uh, adventure. The last minute adventure has only one hour and no notes. How are you going to put it together? And here's a little bit of information. <laughs> and then you have the tables, some names, traditional human, fantastical names, motives, notable traits, astrological signs, temptations, worlds, environments, adventures, and a final note. So, okay, I, I think this is a great book. Uh, uh, yeah, The Old School Referee by Highlander. Highly recommend you guys check it out. Read through it in detail. It's a great thing. If you've been running games for a long time, it's great to be reminded. If you're newer to games, and I, I, a lot of people who comment to my channel say, hey, I'm pretty new to RPGs, I'm pretty new to the OSR, um, I think those sorts of people should read this book. All right, so this was The Old School Referee by Highlander, The Dungeon Dozen 2 by Jason Schultes, and Letters from the Dark, Volume 7, Monster Mass, Mash by Chris Powell. I'll put links below to where you can get all these. All right, guys, I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you all in another video.